so hello and once again welcome to our continuing discussions on mutations today i would like to elaborate on the mechanisms of spontaneous mutation in nature mutations can be of two ways or mutation can occur in two ways one is spontaneously without any reason and the second is induced one the induced mutation will be a part of my second lecture today we will focus on what are the reasons which gives rise to a spontaneous mutation in any cell it may be a eukaryotic cell or a prokaryotic cell but as we are dealing with microbiology here more most of the times i mean to say a bacteria but there may be times where uh, i would like to give eukaryotic examples as a part of the whole process because the basic purpose of studying eukaryotes or prokaryotes is to understand the cellular systems of life in general irrespective of whether that is for a bacteria or a elephant or a plant or a human being and as genetic code is universal in nature all the mechanisms or most of the mechanisms which are basic to genetics do uh, function in the same way before actually going to spontaneous mutation i would like to emphasize on one uh, aspect of point mutation here where one base change one base pair change it as we have seen can alter the reading frame a complete sequence of codons can be changed and that can affect the way a protein functions that can affect the way a metabolism functions that can affect the way a phenotype gets expressed or a genotype gets expressed in a cell so here you can see that one base which is there one single base adenine is changed in a codon uau on the mrna uau which was coding for tyrosine so here nine codons can be a result of one single base change in a example code here uau so i change a so first nucleotide in the codon a is changed you have three different possibilities here the second nucleotide a if it is changed ugu uuu and ucu which can code for cysteine phenylalanine and serine so suddenly one single base three different codons a first nucleotide change if it is there then you can see the probable outcomes can be gau aau and cau which will code for aspartate aspargin and histidine respectively similarly the third nucleotide codon u if it is changed you will have uag which is a stop codon uaa which is a stop codon and uac which codes for a completely new amino acid tyrosine so nine codons can result from a single base change in a single codon depending upon whether that is a first nucleotide in the codon or second or third so this simple example explains us the deleterious effects or the marked effect of a single base change in a reading frame now take into consideration the amino acids which come at that point their biochemical nature whether they are hydrophilic in nature whether they are hydrophobic whether they have the capacity to form bonds internally giving rise to three dimensional structure of a protein all this does matter greatly and alters the phenotype or a genotype of a organism so all this when i say spontaneously a base mutates in the coming slides you will see that there is without any reason in nature in the rate of 10 to minus 6 to 10 to minus 12 that is one cell in that many cells undergoes a sudden permanent change we will try to explore how sudden this sudden is is it really sudden there may be some reasons behind it one thing is for sure you may know the reasons but the things are uncontrolled in the metabolic system of that cell means in a lifestyle of a cell one single base which suddenly changes is uncontrolled in nature if it is controlled or if it can be induced then that is a induced type of mutation 
So based upon the causes of mutation, there are two types of mutation, spontaneous mutation and induced mutation. Induced I will be dealing with my next presentation. Here today we will see spontaneous mutation. Spontaneous mutation occurs naturally without any cause. First thing, rate of spontaneous mutation is very, very, very low as I am emphasizing 10 raised to minus 6 to 10 raised to minus 12. That is one generation in put six zeros in front of one. That many generations, there is one permanent change. So why that thing happens? Because methylation which is there, that is followed by deamination of cytosine and it results into an altered base. I will explain that in my further slides. And this particular change which is there is also repaired. Continuously there is a repair system in the uh, cells, prokaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells. What happens is this repair that is editing function does not allow errors to occur. But still if you see the rate of mutation is somewhat higher in eukaryotes than in prokaryotes because of the complexity of the genome. Genome is much more larger in size and there are many number of cells uh, coming together in making a whole eukaryotic cell. So we will see this one by one induced mutations are those mutations which are induced by physical, chemical or biological agents. Yes, biological agents also do play an important role in inducing the mutations like phages. We will see that all in our next lecture but right now let us focus on spontaneous mutations. The spontaneous mutations were proved that without any reason all of a sudden a cell and its genome has a tendency to undergo a change. Maybe a point mutation, one single base pair change, one base pair substitution, it could be insertion, deletion. The type of mutation which we have seen all may be functional here. But the reason, cause is spontaneous. Unknown I can say. Unknown in the sense not that we really don't know how that thing happens. But why it happens it's not known. So there were three experiments in the history of time, Luria and Dalbrook experiment that is also very famously called as the fluctuation test. They tested whether the mutations are independent of natural selection or whether they are directed by selection. Means uh, to make it very easier, those who are having interest, you can uh, search for these references and go through in detail about Luria Dalbrook experiment, Newcomb experiment. I will be explaining today in short the Lederberg experiment because that is very easy to understand. The experiment used in Newcomb was resistance of phages or E. coli to the phage infection. Resistance of Ischertia coli to the bacteriophage infection. Uh, the experiment was used that is I am speaking about Newcomb experiment. It was used to determine whether the mutations which make Ischertia coli resistant to its parasite T2 phage are spontaneous in nature or whether their resistance is acquired when the infection occurs. So we today know very well what is the whole uh, situation. It is spontaneous in nature. The Lederberg experiment which is there in 1952 it was uh, discovered by Esther Joshua Lederberg, Esther and Joshua Lederberg who performed the experiment which helped to show that mutations are spontaneous, random and not directed. Their experiment was very interesting and it was based upon the fact that if I have a wild type bacterial cell, let us say any cell, Ischertia coli we will take for your understanding, simplification, we have a culture of Ischertia coli cells which is wild type, means it was never exposed to any antibiotics earlier and it is wild type and it has a great sensitivity towards antibiotics. Means if you have the minimum inhibitory concentration of an antibiotic, the cells will die, the cells will be killed. So the whole idea of the experiment is as you can see here, take a master plate, grow all the wild type Ischertia coli cells on it and then what you do is you take a velveteen sterilized velvet cloth, put it on a wooden block that acts as a stamp. The fibers will pick up each colony. So you just stamp that velvet sterilized cloth onto the plate. Of course the size is same and everything is same and it acts as 
a pad for replicating the number of colonies present on the plate. So you have a master plate, it is a plate, normal Maconkey's agar, let us say. You have a sterilized velvet wooden block and when you press it on the original plate, you see on the velvet the same colonies at the same point, at the same place on the plate will be printed on the velvet cloth. Now you take this velvet cloth and replicate it, means just like a stamp, press it on two plates. One plate is one which is not containing any antibiotic, same as the master plate and another is one which is containing antibiotic. It is called as the selective plate. What is expected here? On the master plate as it was same, all colonies will grow similarly as the master plate, same, because that was a replica. Now the same number of colonies, if there are 10 colonies here, you got 10 colonies here because it is just replicating the plate. Plate conditions are also same. In another plate, we took the same plate but we added antibiotics. Antibiotic which would have killed, it is called as minimum inhibitory concentration of antibiotic, just sufficient to kill the bacteria. Just sufficient, not high level, minimum. In that context, what is expected that not a single colony should have grown here because the antibiotic would have inhibited the growth of that wild type Ischergia coli. But surprisingly, Lederberg et al, they found that there were some colonies, few colonies. Naturally, what were these colonies? Those colonies were antibiotic resistant colonies. Now, the question here in discussion is whether they got the resistance to antibiotic after getting exposed to antibiotic means did antibiotic induce the mutation or was it already present there in this plate also means it was present in the original master plate also without exposure without any reason without even having a previous exposure to antibiotic they had resistance how come that is what the whole idea of evolution is that is all the whole idea of spontaneous mutation is spontaneity of a change in a base without any reason. We can understand the cause, we can understand uh, how the mechanism functions, but why it is not understood. That is the way of survival of the fittest, that is the way of surviving any conditions, being prepared for already. So, this is what the theory of spontaneous mutation is all about. If it was induced, remember here, if this plate was induced mutation, then all the colonies would have grown. Why only selective few? These selective few are those mutants which have acquired a spontaneous mutation just because it was exposed to an antibiotic doesn't mean that antibiotic induced a mutation. They were already having that character here. And they just got a chance to show their resistance in this plate. So this is this experiment proves only on one line that if it was induced all colonies would have grown but as it is spontaneous only few colonies they grow. So if you see the causes of mutation in bacteria most of them are spontaneous errors made by DNA, polymer, polymerase enzyme most of the spontaneous errors are made by DNA polymerase error which is there and then polymerase itself rectifies the error. One base in 1000 base pairs replicated during DNA replication by DNA polymerase is responsible for uh, error and that may be causing deleterious effects if it remains there. If the methylase system or the proofreading system of polymerase does not recognize it as correct. There is second reason for spontaneous mutation that is inborn errors in metabolism. Free radicals, the responsive oxygen species, I will come to that, ROS it is called as. So there is a second erroneous metabolism, byproducts of metabolism which give rise to free radicals are also responsible for spontaneous mutation. The second part as I said is induced, it can be physically induced, it can be chemically induced that will be in next lecture. So we will today right now deal with the causes of spontaneous mutations. There are four definite causes, causes 
Now the reasons we never know. That is evolution. That is left to evolution. Causes we know. How it happens. What happens in the nucleotide pool. What biochemical changes it uh, takes place for the spontaneous mutation to occur. That we know very well. There are four reasons for that. Depurination, deamination, tautomerization or tautomeric shifts it is also called as and oxidative stress. You will see these four causes of spontaneous mutation one by one. So the first is depurination. Now what is depurination? You can see here the release of adenine or guanine bases which takes place during uh, uh, process of replication that is purines. Adenines and guanines they have a tendency of suddenly leaving the strand DNA strand during the course of replication means it is just like uh, as you get on go on to get old you lose your teeth suddenly the teeth falls off oh, it's spontaneous aging just like that maybe in stationary phase or death phase there is a, a lack of favorable conditions and this causes lesions lesions in the sense where the replicating strand which is trying to replicate suddenly the purines they are falling off from the dna that is loss or release of adenines or guanine adenine and guanines these are purines so they are released from the dna which results into a gap in the dna this gap may be filled may not be filled these are the spontaneous lesions why they are releasing off it is spontaneous spontaneous uh, lesions one is depurination another is deamination i will come to that also so depurination is one of the most common of the two and it consists of an interruption of the glycosidic bonds between the base and the deoxyribose sugar means the base which is there here this is the nitrogen base phosphate sugar so you see the laser pointer here the first carbon second carbon third carbon is hydroxyl group here fourth and fifth carbon is phosphate on the first carbon of the nitrogen base there is guanine so what happens this is guanine molecule this is a dna strand suddenly with the release of water molecule this guanine is released from the double stranded dna so you have this it has a base but on the first carbon where there should have been a nitrogen base it is released and you have a depurinated sugar so it has a gap in the dna so there is a subsequent loss of guanine or adenine residue from the dna and it looks like this so i would like to just focus on the one two three four five points which are being shown in the figure here so depurination it is a spontaneous mutation which occurs when there is a nucleotide loss this happens during the dna replication and if one nucleotide on one strand has lost a purine base this is called as a purinic site and a purinic site on this strand now cannot provide a template for a complementary base on the newly synthesized strand what will happen when there is replication one base has fallen off a new strand has to be synthesized it just halts there because this this is not providing a template if there was adenine it would have added thymine now there is a, a purinic site means there is no purine there this is called as the depurination so you see here what is happening just i want you to focus on the slide here i'd like to zoom if possible now see if, if you can see this zoom a first part in the first in replication the purinic site cannot provide a template for the complementary base on the strand you see, you see here the double stranded dna t g g c and its complementary dna strand we are explaining dna replication here so you can see here a c c g as the strand separates suddenly there is a g which is a purinic g is lost here g is lost and as g is lost this becomes a purinic t gap g c so there is strand separation replication is there t gap g c with this strand there is no problem it is very normal no mutation normal dna but what happens in this purinic site is that the strand if it has to move forward a nucleotide with a incorrect usually adenine is added there whenever there is a purinic site 
for some unknown reason the adenines they get added there okay so a gc base pairing which was there this gets converted into a at base pairing and it becomes a mutant so a nucleotide which is having a gap here when it is trying to replicate the dna polymerase has one evolutionary function if it finds a uh, gap it will add adenine and complementarily it will add thymine so a nucleotide base with an incorrect base that is incorrect we will call it as because most oftenly adenine is added into it and at the next round of replication what will happen here this this has a gap now this has a gap a is added there is no filling of the gap but a complementary a is added one gap is a purinic it will replicate in the next f2 generation in this gap a will be added again a so subsequently a purinic sites results into a atp base pairing formation new nucleotide which is incorporated it forms at so gc to at is the conversion and i just have explained in the very beginning if one base is changed how uh, hazardously it can have a effect on the whole reading frame so this is depurination the next is deamination this is very simple to understand deamination is removing the amino group from amino acid from amino acid and converting it to ammonia first and as the bases all the bases like cytosine adenine guanine they have amino groups all these can be deaminated <coughs> cytosine adenine guanine they have amino groups in them and deamination it can cause a mutation for example as you can see here cytosine if it is there if it is deaminated it forms uracil if cytosine is deaminated it forms uracil uracil which is an analog of thymine a and u in mrna they form the pairing means a and t a and u so t and u they are analogs which can code with a on the mrna so deamination random deamination of cytosine why deamination takes place deaminase enzyme is there in metabolism maybe that is a functioning abnormally and removing the amine group from cytosine converting it into a uracil now this uracil which is there the polymerase would put an adenine in the corresponding uracil cytosine was there it had guanine cytosine and guanine now this cytosine rounds of replication this guanine second round has no issues but this cytosine which has got converted into uracil the second round of replication which starts uracil a will be added so again a gc base pairing is converted into at base pairing so in the template strand of the dna the polymerase would put in an adenine at the corresponding position of the new strand and <coughs> instead of guanine so gc gets converted to <coughs> at sorry so what happens is this one single base pair change can result into a frame shift mutation the hydrolysis reaction of deamination uh, is spontaneous again one more thing as you can see here cytosine if it is now methylated if there is a methyl group added it becomes 5 methyl cytosine and 5 methyl cytosine if it is deaminated it becomes thymine again see how chemical transformations can take place which are mediated by other chemicals or enzymes think over it again i am saying there are certain biomolecules which can be chemically transformed by virtue of some other chemicals or by enzymes here methylation is taking place a methyl group is added here and it becomes 5 methyl cytosine this 5 methyl cytosine has a second enzymatic reaction of deamination or a chemical reaction of deamination and this gets converted into thymine so loss of a amino group from a base is called as deamination deamination occurs very spontaneously by virtue of spontaneous mutation and this example can be given in induced mutation also it can be induced by mutagenic agents also <coughs> so the same deamination of cytosine yields uracil deamination of 5 methyl cytosine results into thymine and uh, uh, unpaired uracil residues will pair unpaired uracil residues will pair with adenine will pair this this cytosine deamination uracil this will pair with adenine and this thymine will pair with uh, adenine again 
One more uh, example here is, as I said, conversion of 5-methylcytosine to thymine and uh, this, as it is thymine, 5-methylcytosine which was earlier cytosine means a GC base pairing getting converted into AT base pairing again. So these are the effects of deamination. How this happens? We have seen. Why this happens? The answer is spontaneous. Okay. The third example is of tautomeric shifts. Each and every molecule, biomolecule, adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine, they uh, exist in keto forms and enol forms. Each of the bases in the DNA can appear in several forms and these are called as tautomers, which are isomers in that position of their atoms and in the bonds between the atoms. Not only in the position of their atoms, but also between the bonds between their atoms. As you can see here, thymine, it is a keto form and adenine, it is an amino form. This is normal Watson and Crick pairing, standard base pairing. Again, a Watson and Crick pairing, cytosine, which is amino form and guanine, which is a keto form. So, C, G, A, T, normal base pairing. See what happens, the keto form. Okay, C double bond, C bond O is keto and C bond amine is this C bond amine is amino form and this C O is keto form. This is keto, this is, yeah. so the bond which are important in bringing the two bases together, they, when they undergo change, we have seen in the last lecture, they can go shifts, tautomeric shifts we can call it as. When such shifts occur, the keto and the uh, amino form, they change into enol and keto respectively. Conversion of keto group in the thymine, you can see here keto group in the thymine gets converted into enol of thymine. Thymine enol form. So thymine and guanine, guanine as you can see this keto Thymine now has the capacity to act bond with three hydrogen bonds with guanine. This is irregular base pairing or tautomerism. We can call this as tautomerism, where a GT base pairing has taken place act virtually. Come on, this is not normal. How can a G pair with T? Yes, it can when there is a thymine which is normally in its keto form has now tautomerically got converted into enol form and enolic form of thymine now acquires the capacity to bond with guanine. Same with cytosine. The amino form of cytosine is now converted into amino form of cytosine and that acquires a capacity to bond with adenine. So CA pairing, GT pairing, abnormal or anomalous base pairings do take place spontaneously and this is what is called as tautomeric shifts or tautomerism. Naturally, A pairs with T and G pairs with T, uh, C sorry, G pairs with C, we know very well. But adenine in its immuno form pairs with cytosine and thymine in its enol form, as you can see thymine in its enol form pairs with guanine. So conversion of keto group in thymine and guanine to enol and changing amino group in adenine and cytosine to immuno form are examples of tautomerism. This is called as tautomeric shifts. So what happens when there is a tautomeric shift? This is a first DNA, the first F1 generation, you get parental DNA. Strand separation has taken place. So there are, for your understanding, there are two AT base pairings given. First is AT, second is AT. So, 282 GC are given. Don't focus on GC. Let us just see AT base pairing. So, what is happening in this A? There is a tautomeric shift to immuno form. Now, as I said, when adenine shifts to immuno form, when it shifts to immuno form, it can base pair with cytosine. Instead of thymine, it base pairs with cytosine. So, two strands will form four strands. So, I will take this strand which is normal on the left side there is no mutation and this is a wild type DNA. But in the another strand as adenine has got converted into immuno form, it now base pairs with cytosine. As long as it can sustain its immuno form, means you can ask a question that how long it will remain in its immuno form. 
or it can shift back its to its amino form also but that is what is spontaneous it is very spontaneous it can keep shifting from amino to amino amino to amino as long as it is in its amino form it will be normal as it shifts its tautomeric uh, character to amino form it will pair with cytosine and this cytosine it will result into gc base pairing because this now has a cytosine added in front of adenine polymerase polymerase has added cytosine and this becomes anomalous ca base pairing or wrong ca base pairing so this thing happens and at base pairing gets converted into gc base pairing in the successive rounds of replication this is not in that dna a cell which has undergoing this keto enol shifts or tautomeric shifts will show mutagenic agents in the next rounds of replication and as long as it goes on uh, changing its character more and more mutations will be there so if it is induced mutation giving rise to such sort of shifts then the rate of mutation is very high in that generation only but in spontaneously as i said in a very low frequency this takes place and spontaneous mutations do take place in nature the last type of spontaneous mutation is dna damage due to oxidative stress oxidative stress is defined as a state in which oxidation exceeds the antioxidation system in a cell means what happens if you recall the hydrogen peroxide test which we do in our bsc second year uh, practicals of h2o2 breaking down into hydrogen and water by the uh, enzyme which is uh, hydrogen peroxidase enzyme system and uh, the peroxidase enzyme system breaks it down into catalase we call that enzyme as catalase and it breaks down hydrogen peroxide into hydrogen sorry water and oxygen why do enzymes have that that catalase enzyme to break down hydrogen peroxide hydrogen peroxide is a metabolic by product of some metabolism and if that is formed in the cell it is a highly reactive oxygen species it can it is called as a highly reactive oxygen species means it is free radicals it is a free radical it is grouped under the free radicals what happens what is the issue with this free radicals when free radicals are formed even in your body when you eat lot of junk food i would like to take this opportunity to tell you that when you eat junk food which are abnormal fried foods unnatural foods which the nature has not given you i am not here debating or discussing about whether that is animal food or plant food that livestock or feed stock no both are good as long they are natural in their cultivation not hybrid or let us say not fried too much oil is one very important source of uh, giving rise to free radicals in your body what happens free radicals are formed inside your body you don't consume them during metabolism free radicals are formed and disturbance in the balance between the uh, production of this reactive oxygen species that is the free radicals and the antioxidant defense what is antioxidant defense there are certain chemicals which can act as an antioxidant the more antioxidants you have the more cheerful youthful happy long longevity agitivity will be there because these free radicals if they are more if free radicals exceed the antioxidant system releasing the uh, free radicals imbalances the antioxidant system then there are huge effects in a cellular system <coughs> in multicellular system inflammation of white blood cells mitochondria is greatly affected smoking is one of the reasons smoke when people smoke they are constantly generating free radicals in their body how does why it said that smoking causes cancer because free radicals it, it damages the dna when there is free radical it damages the dna causes formation of free radicals due to white blood cell inflammation mitochondria uh, errors mitochondrial error smoking ionization radiations air pollution your ultraviolet light exposure all these forms free radicals which greatly damages the dna and this is spontaneous mutation <coughs> oxidative stress causes several types of dna damage 
Now in the next slide, I will tell you how many products can be formed. All the products are cancer causing in humans and in bacteria, they can result into cell death. So defects in DNA repair mechanism leads to genomic instability. All the DNA, it has a capacity to repair, but that repair system itself is hampered due to oxidative stress. Oxidative stress causes several types of DNA damage like double stranded break as you can see this is oxidative stress on the DNA and it can cause the formation of 8 hydroxy deoxy guanosine. <coughs> this is a base mismatch base analog 8 hydroxy deoxy guanosine is a product of oxidative stress and it causes wrong incorporation during the DNA replication. Second effect is single strand break. As you can see, single strand breakage is taking place, which again damages the DNA. Crosslink interstrand matching may take place. Means if you see this strand with another strand, the strand to strand matching, they join and they won't be separable. DNA polymerase enzyme will stop there. Second is double stranded breaks. Both the strand, they can be broken and there is a complete loss of DNA. No replication. Cell death. Crosslink intrastrand means instead of the opposite the adjacent bases they can form pairing and they result into a duct adduct it is called add uct adducts which again act as a speed breaker to the dna polymerase which is replicating so this is in eukaryotes in prokaryotes in multicellular system it is uh, oxidative stress results into a genotoxic damage mitochondrial dysfunctioning takes place cognitive impairment takes place understanding is very low you see those persons who have a constant habit of smoking or tobacco or alcohol whatever they don't have a cognitive sense of understanding they don't understand the things why their brain function is hampered that is due to the oxidative stress of those chemicals which are acting on your metabolism Synaptic diffus necrosis and cell death takes place which may result into cancer in the multicellular system. So as I said earlier, I cannot resist myself when I am explaining prokaryotic systems. There will be examples where you uh, give it with respect to eukaryotic systems because the main purpose of understanding prokaryotes is a single simple cell which is a model for the eukaryotic systems. All the examples which are applicable to uh, E. coli is applicable to a big bunion tree or a big elephant or you and me itself when it comes to the universality of the code of course so this is the types of spontaneous mutation dna damage due to oxidative stress can result into responsive oxygen species which results into oxidative stress so what is this reactive oxygen species this or the response or the reactive oxygen species reactive oxygen species is a phrase which is used to describe the number of reactive molecules and free radicals which are formed from molecular oxygen. The production of oxygen based radicals is a curse to all aerobic species. Production of oxygen which is based on radicals, free radicals, it is a curse. Means as long as our body will keep on preparing free radicals, we are going to die one day. We can become immortal if we don't produce free radicals in our body. I am not exaggerating. Listen to the statement once again. If our body would have produced zero free radicals, then we would have been immortal. If you see old people of old generation, they didn't have all the junk food which we used to eat. Therefore, they live long. Even today, Japan is the country where there are people over 100 years old because their lifestyle is completely natural regional seasonal food they eat regional and seasonal food they eat reasonably eat the regional food seasonally and reasonably means with some common sense why do you need a uh, chinese food in a region called as parbani which is so hot and humid and with lot of soy sauce and ajinomoto added in it selling in the roadsides is going to generate lot of free radicals in your body think about it on the contrary if you eat the banana which is very good produced in our black cotton soil if you eat the 
mangoes in the season season if you eat all the citrus food in the season vegetables they all are antioxidants as long as you are consuming antioxidants natural antioxidants it will not allow the reactive oxygen species to form these reactive oxygen species are molecules produced as a by product during the mitochondrial electron transport system of the aerobic respiration or by the oxidoreductases enzymes or the metal catalyzed enzymes and which have a probability of giving rise to huge mutations so we say most of the times that this person next person has cancer how come he has cancer he has not consuming alcohol he is not consuming uh, tobacco he has good habits he exercises daily but did you ever see what he eats maybe he is a junk food lover then he is as good as a smoker or a alcoholic and he is bound to increase the number of free radicals or the reactive oxygen species in his body and one day going to die so free radicals you pause this slide and read just for your example i have given here superoxide hydroxyl radicals nitric oxide hydrogen peroxide these are the compounds which give rise to free radicals <laughs> superoxide is a chemical it is formed by reduction of oxygen molecule with one electron one electron is removed it becomes superoxide hydroxyl radical the most reactive hydroxyl radical when generated in excess causes cell death okay and it is generated from hydrogen peroxide in the presence of ferrous ions hydrogen peroxide is a by product of metabolism nitric oxide it is synthesized from amino acids many amino acids they have uh, nh uh, n n o n amine group is there and that when it undergoes rns metabolism it gives rise to nitric oxide nitrous oxide is also a mutagenic agent as is nitric oxide is a free radical hydrogen peroxide itself is very harmful for the metabolism it is formed in two ways indirectly through the superoxide dismutase enzyme system or directly with respect to Uh, oxidative reactions associated with transfer of two electrons to the oxygen when oxygen gets two electrons it becomes hydrogen peroxide so it ready what is this hydrogen peroxide it has a ready diffusion inside the cells it can go inside the cell interact with the dna and cause oxidative stress there so free radicals these are highly reactive and oxidative compounds they can react and oxidize lipids amino acids carbohydrates as well as dna causing mutations in the dna in the bacteria as well as multicellular system so e, now just ask me a question are the are these only four free radicals formed in metabolism my answer is there in the next slide see how many free radicals have been mapped till date there may be many more because nobody knows what you are eating how you are drinking water ample of water also removes free radical good water clean water keep you hydrated breathing exercises jogging helping yourself with some physical exercise helps in removing the free radicals so how many free radicals are these only four no see this these are the dna based products of interaction with reactive oxygen free radical species these four when they react with dna bases they can form these many compounds all are hazardous in nature all can cause cancer in humans or cell death in other cellular systems 5 hydroxy 6 hydrothiamine thiamine glycol 5 dihydrothiamine 5 hydroxy methyl uracil 5 formyl methylyl 5 hydroxy 5 methyl hydrand dantoin all these are compounds which have a mutagenic effect on the dna and all are products of free radicals or the reactive oxygen species so these all are generated spontaneously during uncontrolled no but there is nothing uh, no system to control not forming these compounds and these are very deleterious and dangerous in their effects so here in the bacteria you can see in this slide this is a overview of damage caused by reactive oxygen species in e coli so you see auto oxidation of fadh2 when it is oxidized it gives rise to superoxide dismutase and other enzymes which then 
act on the DNA and damage the DNA. Okay, this this superoxide dismutase with iron. It requires iron. It acts on the DNA, damaging. What type of damage is there? As I said, single stranded breaks, double stranded breaks, adjacent DNA, adduct formation, whatever we have just seen, all can be found. And but E. coli has a very uh, interesting way of repairing itself. We will see these aspects in repair mechanism. But the same auto oxidation of FADH2 can also damage the mononuclear ion enzymes. It can damage the iron sulfur cluster proteins. All this can be repaired. But that is why E. coli is special or that is why prokaryotes are special. They are primitive in their organization. They have remained as one single cell and they are efficiently carrying out their own maintenance throughout the evolution. So this is all about spontaneous mutation of DNA, damage caused due to DNA spontaneously. Now there is another method also where mutations can be induced by using physical, chemical and biological agents. Some interesting examples of these we will see in our next lecture in the mechanism of induced mutations. Mutations are a part and parcel of life. Mutations are the raw materials for evolution. Mutations are what has made us today what we are. We are byproducts of evolution. We are what we eat. When we eat, we become what we eat. Because your food provides energy, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, phosphorus, lipid, all the sources. And these are controlled at the level of DNA. Even DNA is the what you can say, control, headquarter for all the phenotypic and genotypic character given to a life system, eukaryotic or prokaryotic. So right from the time when you were a baby in your mother's womb, you have been eating food. What type of food your mother ate? That type of food you are going to eat. And as you go on getting matured, you decide what I am going to eat. So all these metabolic errors gives rise to these hundreds and thousands of different types of inborn metabolic errors and they may be responsible for the change in you. So choose wisely, live wisely. That is the main thing which we can learn from genetics. Till then the next mechanism study well, try to understand these phenomenons, apply it in your life, have a good and healthy happy life. We will see the induced mutation in our next